And, and this is maybe my biggest piece of advice. And maybe this is the yogi within me sharing this, but I really believe that developing practices to seek clarity in your life is maybe the most important thing you can do as an entrepreneur because it's the, the needs of the business are constantly changing. And what's important as, as the founder is that you see when those needs present themselves and you can respond accordingly um, and make good decisions. Great businesses are a, an accumulation of good decisions made over a long period of time. And so to make good decisions, you need to be clear which means take the time to go develop a meditation practice, get into breath work, go to a yoga class, go walk in the woods by yourself, take whatever it is for you. It's not prescriptive for all. It's like, go find out what it is that helps you find clarity and go do more of that because it will service you tenfold on the journey. <clears throat> Hi, this is Joe Kudla. I'm the founder and CEO of Viori, and you are on Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hey, welcome to another episode of the show. Joe, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I should say thanks for having us to your Encinitas headquarters. Your one of your beautiful. This is the original retail shop, right? Yeah, almost. We we started in a pop up about two blocks um, south of here. But this was the first full lease that we signed. And um, as a matter of fact, we used to office, believe it or not, in the back stock area of this of this store because we couldn't afford the store and an office. Well, it's kind of cool, though, because there's like the Pilates store, uh, P Pilates, uh, what do we call that? Uh, studio next door. And it's a, if you're here in Encinitas, you, if you know the vibe, you know. Yeah. But if you don't, it's like super like uh, there's a taco shop over here and then there's a little trolley that goes by there and like the oceans maybe just a stone's throw to our right it's a pretty cool little atmosphere uh it really is yeah. um you know i grew up in seattle moved to california when i was 18 but when i stumbled on encinitas i knew that this was home you know it's such an aspirational little beach community and really encinitas was the original inspiration for viore we were really just trying to build product for for this community here. So yeah, it's very much home for us. Well, I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? Break <laughs> it down for me. Yeah, um, it was a very long journey and it's it's interesting when you frame it like that because it really conjures up um, what was very true for me. Um, and that was that, you know, I was a, I grew up, you know, a, a quote unquote jock. I grew up playing every sport under the sun, it was very active in my body and, um, never really nurtured a creative bone in my body. And, but I always had a deep appreciation for brands. I loved, I loved how brands told stories and, and captured my imagination. What were some of those brands? You, so you're in Washington, not yeah. too far from a, a big brand, a little further yeah. north. Yeah, so a lot of surf and ski brands. Okay. You know, I grew up in the skiing in the mountains and, and outside of Seattle, but always kind of dreamt of living on the beaches of Southern California. So I followed surf culture, even from far from home, you know, far away from the beach. Yeah. Um, so, you know, at the time it was Quicksilver and Billabong and O'Neill and all, all those legacy surf brands um, were really inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I always, I always loved watching brands, but, but never took an art class, didn't trust my own instincts and I would never have called myself a creative. Um, but as I've gotten older, um, you know, I've really like developed a passion for uh, product and design. And, and, you know, when I graduated from college, I went to University of San Diego. I got an accounting degree. And um, the summer before I was supposed to start my first job in the fall, um, I, I didn't have a job. And somebody approached me about um, going to Milan and working in the fashion shows. Hmm. And um, so I went to this big casting in La Jolla and they, they chose me to go to Milan and work with this agency called Why Not. It was a great agency at the time. And uh, and so I got my diploma. Okay, wait, so in what capacity? Were, like, were you a model? Yeah, or? this was to walk the show okay, as a model. Okay, very cool, yeah. I it's, mean, you know, you're a good looking guy and you've got the right height and, you know, maybe the the, the bone structure. <laughs> thank you. For, very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it's a bit embarrassing uh, to talk about now, but not you know, really. I mean, that's kind of cool. It was a, it was a funny. I didn't get to go abroad. You know, when I was in college, a lot of my friends went to Spain and um, you know different abroad uh, programs abroad. I didn't get to go, so I looked at this as like my t opportunity to go abroad, and I had never been to Europe. And so I got my diploma. I got on a plane that night. I flew to Milan. Oh, wow. Okay. And I ended up writing a letter to the firm that I was supposed to start with in the fall, which was a big CPA firm. And I just told them, look, I've ex you know, found something new and exciting. And um, you know, I need to see where this goes. And you know, I was meeting people from all around the world. Yeah, of course. Traveling a lot. Opens worked. your eyes up. I was opening. Yeah, I opened my eyes. And, and I, I loved working with designers. I loved watching them build these collections and how much passion they had for their product. I didn't necessarily resonate with being a model, if I'm being honest, but um, it was such an exciting time of my life. After a couple years of doing that and traveling, I realized that I wanted to start my career and come back home. So put a timestamp on that time period, the, the day you got on the airplane to Milan, what, when was that? So I graduated in May of 2000. Okay. So this is a big time in history, right? Like, so the internet is just a baby. Uh, people are just starting maybe a couple of years ago to discover email. <laughs> um, you know, uh, websites are uh, becoming a thing. Brands are starting to build websites for their products. E-commerce is not really a thing yet no. though. Um, AOL is mailing out disks so you can get on the internet. If uh, for the young people who don't know what that is, it's a little disc you used to put into a computer and then you could log in and you had a modem and it was dial up and super slow. Yeah. Uh, and then the following year, the world changed with 2001. So it's like we were worrying about Y2K at the time. It was a thing. Yeah. Uh, so this is like, you know, kind of at the crest of a big wave. Oh, yeah. I mean, I showed up at Milan. I had a little, um, actually, I don't even think I had a flip phone. I think I got my first cell phone while I was living in Europe. Um, and I had like prepaid calling cards that I would use. Yeah. But, well, these are the Blackberry days. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. And this was before. I mean, I had, was a broke college kid, you know, barely had enough money to get myself to Milan. And, um, you know, when I, I remember I landed, I was so jet lagged. I just graduated college and I'm walking through the streets with this big thing of luggage trying to find this modeling agency. And it's not like you just plug in an address into a phone. I was walking around with a big map, totally yeah. lost. Yeah. You know. There's no Google Maps. <laughs> yeah. There's no Apple Maps. Yeah. There's none of that. Yeah. So. So you had this fold out thing and you're walking around the streets of Italy. Yeah. yeah. So, so I ended up, you know, what what was supposed to be a summer job turned into a couple years and i lived in you know milan and then spain and then germany and then i went to new york and then i went back to italy and you know i was working for all these incredible designers and i only mention that as part of the story because it it is really what i think sparked my interest in working in fashion in apparel and i think if it wasn't for that experience i wouldn't have had maybe the confidence to jump into this space that I really knew nothing about. What an incredible experience though. If friends, Italian friends tell me that uh, Italy in particular, they, and my dad spent a lot of time there, he was in the wine business, but um, he said they really have life figured out the balance. That you know, when they work, they work really hard, but when they relax or they play, or in the eating, they don't talk about work, you know, they talk about life and they talk about you know, letting yeah. their hair down, whatever, but it's like, that lifestyle is so different than the hustle culture here in the United States. Yeah. I mean, maybe not Encinitas. <laughs> there's like uh, taco culture here, but no, there's, there's a lot of hustle here too, but yeah. it's different, right? It is, yeah. you know, and I had to stop myself short of writing a, you know, a, a diatribe on life lessons to this partner at Ernst and Young when I wrote my handwritten letter, um, you know, sipping on wine one evening, telling him I wasn't coming back to start my job. Yeah. Um, so I saved that part, but that was very much what was true for me was like this, this European way of life was, was very inspiring um, at the time. Yeah. Okay. So where'd you go from there? I came back, I started my career at Ernst & Young in the audit practice. Okay. So, you know, went right back into a highly analytical. Crunching numbers. Crunching numbers, very busy job, but a great place to start your career. Um, have a tremendous amount of respect for Ernst and Young and, and the years that I spent there. Um, and then after a couple of years there, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley was this this new regulation 
post Enron where um, companies had to certify they had internal controls to protect against fraud. And it became a big booming industry for accountants. And so um, I ended up leaving and I started a uh, consulting practice with um, a couple of friends. Um, it was called Vaco, and uh, it was a, a San Diego-based practice where we were helping clients with, you know, accounting and finance needs. So we were essentially like a recruiting slash staffing company for senior level accounting talent. And, you know, it was interesting because I was, while I was doing that, I was starting my first apparel brand out of the garage. So, um, and it actually predated that experience. It was when I was at Ernst & Young, um, I met a girl, she was going to fit a design school. Sure. And very famous, very famous design school. And yeah. when she graduated, she was very talented. And, you know, I just was like, let's start our own brand. And uh, she was going to go work for, you know, uh, a larger uh, fashion company. And we just decided we were going to go it, go out on our own and start our own brand, not knowing anything about how apparel was made. We just, I just really wanted to, I think, I think work in a creative field, but also surround myself with creative people. I think coming out of that experience in Europe, um, that was something that maybe was missing going back into a highly analytical career. Yeah. Were you making money though? Was it, was it profitable? No, the first, uh, so Viore, as we know it, is my third apparel brand. Okay. Um, the first two were, I call them out of the garage brands. Well, I know I'm asking about your experience in Europe. Like, so you, how long were you there? I was there about two years. Okay. So did you make any money or is it more like, you know, you, you paid to go to the school of hard knocks, like you learned, what, what was that experience like? It was definitely paycheck to paycheck. Okay. Um, yeah. Waiting tables and Well, no, modeling. I was able to model full time. Okay. So there was enough income to pay for my lifestyle. Okay. Um, and then come home and have enough money to buy, you know, a used car to kind of get my foundation started. Yeah. So, so I was, I was, I was working a, yeah. a little bit. But you went out, you, you, so you saw the world, you sort of got, you did your study abroad, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then you came back and you got a real job at Ernst & Young yeah. as, an, as, a, and as an accountant. Yeah. Uh, you know, a traditional but boring job, right? And, and then you probably got a little money saved and you parlayed that into a side hustle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. All of the income that I was making from Ernst & Young, and mind you, you know, Ernst & Young and all of the big CPA firms, they have a reputation for working you pretty hard. Yeah, yeah. So, there's a big six or maybe a big four now. There's been yeah. consolidation, yeah. Yeah. And so they were really busy days, but on my lunch breaks, I would go down to these local cut and sew vendors and we would get samples made. And then the mm -hmm. next day I'd go pick them up. And, you know, we, we learned, I, I got introduced to the local San Diego manuf, you know, apparel industry. And mm -hmm. there were, there were, a, you know, garment, um, you know, pattern makers, there were grading and markers, there were cutting factories, there were cut and sew factories. So I started getting to know this industry and, you know, on the weekends we'd go source fabric in LA from jobbers, mm -hmm. and, you know, essentially buying remnant fabric, you know, that yeah. was left over. And then we would find things we liked and we would come down, we'd work with a pattern maker and make a, make a skirt or a dress. And the first brand that we started was called Sammy Joe. It was women's contemporary clothing, which I had no business being in, but such a great way to learn. Um, and we would make these, these incredible garments. And then we would go out on the, on the weekends and, and sell them up and down the California coast. This is before the internet. So this is walking into boutiques cold and asking if we could talk to the buyer, mm -hmm. which was oftentimes, you know, it was the person who owned the boutique. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we would show them the product and some of them would carry it. And it was a great little experience, you know, just to understand how you go from conception to product to sell in to collecting a receivable and, you know, all of the basics of, of building a business. But that company was never really set up for scale. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, what strikes me about just like hearing you tell that story. It seems like you were very fabric first rather than like design first or like company or logo for it's like. Let's get down to the fabric. So can I tell you a quick side story about me? Because we, uh, I love puns, but we're kind of cut from the same cloth in many ways. So uh, I worked my way through college at Ralph Lauren. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and I worked retail, uh, sucking money aside, you know, while I went to school. And I actually got to meet Ralph. And, I, and Ralph really inspired me. He invited me back to New York and I got to go and visit. These were like the double RL, day, oh, double yeah. RL days. 
But another thing is there is this guy, this young guy would come into our store a lot and he would buy stacks of polo shirts, you know, the old, you know, knitted polo. And he would buy like small, medium, large, extra large, double extra large, like the whole stack. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, no, I'm just getting these, you know. And uh, we got to know each other. This guy's name was Sean. And, um, and Sean would come in, seems like, you know, like every month and buy something new of Ralph. And, uh, and so I got more curious because I sort of would help Sean every time we'd come in. He's like, yeah, it's no big deal. You know, I'm interested in design. I love what Ralph's doing. And, uh, and so I figured out who this guy was. Sean Stussy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Sean would come into the polo store and, you know, I would help him with the polo shirts. But I found out that Sean was taking these to his pattern maker and basically reverse engineering Ralph's shirts. And then uh, when Ralph invited me, you know, back, I started seriously thinking about going into apparel. And I like, maybe saw myself after graduation, like, hey, maybe I'm going to like run one of these, run Ralph's brand. That would be fun. But I did. I get to, I got to go up to the, uh, the, Cal, the Cal Mart, the LA Mart, and look at all these fabrics. And so as you're telling the story, I'm remembering, you know, these years ago, looking at buttons and zippers. And I was in the, um, all these cut and sew shops. It's fascinating, right? Because yeah. a lot of these shops have all the brands in them mm -hmm. and they're sort of assigned just you know a different label this is the cut and sew guy is just doing all the different brands yeah and then have you been to the one where they do like all the wash techniques have you seen the yeah. big bins yeah yeah and it blew me away seeing oh well there's like ralph's jeans going into that bin with two or three pumice stones and then there's like at the time there's like calvin or tommy or yeah. whoever it was flavor of the weekend it's like it's the same shop different wash process. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it was really cool to start my career in apparel in the US because the when manufacturing is here, you're close to it. And so you can go and visit these these factories and you you see it being made. Well, and there's only a handful of factories doing it, yeah. as it turns out, right? Yeah. There's like the preferred manufacturers and it's sort of, I don't want to say they have a monopoly, but it's like, this is where you go if you want to get yeah. your board short done. Yeah. Right? That's right. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and we were making product here in San Diego, which was even less sophisticated, but we didn't have dye houses and things like that, wash factories, so you would have to go to LA. So we'd be hauling up, you know, a trunk full of like, you know, half-made garments up to LA to get them washed. And yeah, I mean, everything we were doing, I look back on those times and it was like, you know, the naivety of it was really special because, you know, we just, we were very ignorant. We didn't know what we were doing, but we just jumped in People told us, go to LA to visit this dye house. We'd drive up there and mm -hmm. visit them and bring our apparel with us. And, you know, I think that's how sometimes you just have to get started. And I wouldn't have changed anything. I think not having known everything that it takes to build an apparel brand was a, an advantage because, yeah. you know, folks that come up through a career in this industry, they're in some ways a little bit limited in the sense that they know too much. I totally agree. And they're called garmentos, yeah. right? Those, those old school guys that are somewhat jaded, or like, oh, I've seen this before a thousand times. You'll never be successful creating a, you know, a cool you know, jogger set for women. That'll never go, Joe. What a terrible <laughs> idea, right. right? And then it turns out it's like the best idea ever. Right, you know? right, yeah. Yeah, and you know, if you do one job in a big company, like let's say you're a merchant, your job is very busy, just as a merchant. So when you think about, okay, now I've got design, I've got product development, I've got the merchandising function, I've got to plan the inventory, you know, I've got a- QC. Yeah, QC, and then I've got all the selling functions, sales and marketing, and then the operational support and all these yeah. things. You're like, I was just working 60 hours a week just being a merchant. How am I gonna do all of those jobs? Yeah. And what you, what you realize in the early days of a journey like this, um, or at least what was very true for us, was that you know, you, if, if the whole page is like you know, a merchant's job, you would do a corner, just the, the mission critical aspects of that merchandising role. And you would do the critical aspects of the product developer's role. So there was a lot of things you aren't doing, but you're doing the really important things to just keep the business moving. And then as you go, you know, you, you expand and all of these functional areas of your business will, will start to grow. 
but but you really don't need that fully built out. Like in the early days, you need great product, you need great marketing vision, um, and you need to go out and sell. You need to find distribution. That's it. You know, yeah. it's like boiling it down to its simplest form. And so for for that reason, I think, you know, my ignorance was was a gift in the sense that it gave me the the confidence um, to jump into this space. Yeah, so I'll extract another lesson that I'm hearing, and this is a sort of a reoccurring theme with really successful people, is this idea of proximity. Like, you didn't exactly know what was gonna happen, but you just moved your bones, and you got in the proximity of where you thought you needed to be at the given time. So people said, hey, you know, the cut and sew shop you need to go to is, you know, uh, up there or the fabric you need is in LA or North Carolina or New York, you know, you know, you probably just did whatever it took to go there, but not knowing whether or not it was going to work out. Right. And so this idea and whatever industry or, or company you're building, get yourself in the proximity of the potential to be successful yeah. and just move and then fail fast, recover, um, how are you funding all of this activity? I mean, it was sort of, it was a bootstrapping, right? It was bootstrapping, yeah. shoestring budget. You know, I would take all of the savings, you know, that I could put aside from working at Ernst and Young and, and then eventually, you know, Vaco, which, you know, was a, you know, I joined and, and started Vaco because I knew I'd have more flexibility yeah. and time to dedicate towards my passion projects. Yeah. Which, so I, I took all that funding. It was just a, you know, a regular W2 wage and, you know, credit cards and things of that nature. Yeah. And so does that get us to VR yet? Um, sort of. Um, so the staffing business, Vaco, I, I ran that business for eight years with friends. Oh, wow. I okay. ended up starting a second apparel brand that kind of followed the same fate. We, we ran into the great financial crisis. We were talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. 2007, 2008, all of a sudden, you know, T-shirts were being sold you know, organic cotton t-shirts were being sold at Walmart for $25. Our business predicated on that, you know, remember that premium t-shirt market back in the early 2000s when, you know, you had like Ed Hardy and those mm -hmm. kind of brands selling 60, 80, $100 just t-shirts. Yeah. You know, our, our second business was kind of in that world. And so again, funded out of the, you know, personal income from my day job, um, no outside funding. Were you doing e-commerce at all at that point? No, this was still yeah hand-to-hand -hand combat. Still very much boutiques were very strong, yep. and, and that's how a lot of people bought their clothes. Was like yeah. you know Nordstrom, these specialty boutiques, and that was how the industry worked. You would sell into these really influential boutiques like Kitson in L.A. or Fred Siegel, and then mm -hmm. you know. Nordstrom would take note that you were performing at those stores and then you would kind of work your way up into these monolithic That's right. wholesale empires. Yeah. Um, and so that was the, the world that we were in as well, following that path. It wasn't until we started Viore that um, we changed that distribution model, um, largely out of necessity. Mm -hmm. And there's a long story there, but but you know, we started we started Viore we thought that we could build the business again on a pretty shoestring budget. This time, the one difference was I decided to jump in with two feet. And I really do attribute that to this success. If I would have tried to build this business um, as a side hustle, it just wouldn't have worked. Yeah, all in. You have to be all in. In apparel especially, this is an all-consuming lifestyle. If you choose to build an apparel brand, it's um, and you know, any business for that matter, I know some people can have success with side hustles that can kind of naturally evolve into a full-time gig, but, yeah. but what was true for me was that, you know, I needed to cut the bow lines. And well, you'd also been there and done that. You tried it and you'd sort of had dip your toe in. So you'd seen what like being uh, half pregnant felt like, Yeah. and then you wanted to go all in. Yeah. Um, so you, you're using the word we a lot, which is generous. Uh, there's a t there's there's more than just Joe behind this, but like who was it in the early days? It was it was you and who's the, who's the we? Well, you know there was there was an early kind of team mm -hmm. that that came together to bring this to life, and it's we're we talking about like thirty people, or we're talking oh about no no, um, a good friend of mine, a guy named Chris Miller, was a professional skateboarder and had started some. Um, apparel brands in in the surf skate industry um and 
Chris and I were going to do this together. So the early days, Chris and I were pontificating. We were surfing together. We were going to yoga classes. We were, you know, like friends with this really cool community here in Encinitas. And we were always talking about how like this, this lifestyle is really like the, uh, the foundation for a really great brand. So we talked a lot about that. And, um, and so Chris w is on our board still today. He never actually joined the company, uh, full time in the, in those early days. Um, but he's on our board and a great partner, a great advisor to the business. Um, and then our CMO, um, Nikki Sikilio joined me very early, very early days and our, and our first designer, Rebecca Bray. And it was really the three of us that, that would work in that garage and kind of chip away at it. So the show or the series is called behind the brand. Let's talk about the Viore brand. Where's the name come from? It's a Finnish word. It means mountain. And a lot of people ask if I'm Finnish, which I'm not. Um, but I love the meaning of it. Uh, as we were talking about earlier, my friends and I are trying to climb all the 14,000 foot peaks in California. We're about halfway there. And, you know, when I was thinking about the, the brand that we wanted to create, like what we wanted it to stand for, I always draw, drew parallels to my experience climbing mountains. And you know, it's, it's very arduous. Like I get a little bit of altitude sickness. So in some ways it's like a suffer fest mm -hmm. and uh, it's like a bit of a spirit march for me. Okay. You know, it's, it's tough going up. You sleep at 12,000 feet, you know, typically or somewhere up in that altitude. I don't, you don't get any sleep. You're freezing at night, you wake up at three in the morning, you slug it up to the top. But when the sun comes up and you're on top of that mountain, it is the most inspiring sense of accomplishment. Yeah. And, and the world becomes clear. And I was like, that's what we want to capture with this brand. And so Viore means mountain. Um, and our tagline, the rise of the shine is really symbolic of that journey to the top, you know, rising up in the face of obstacles, the shine being that sense of accomplishment when you get there. Yeah. I love that story. Is there a backstory too? like, did you go through other iterations of, of other names that you considered? Like what didn't make the cut? I'm always curious about that. <laughs> you know, I was really clear. So, um, Viore was a name that um, was used in my second apparel business. Okay. So it was a totally different company, um, different mission, but the name was Viore. And I always loved, like, I loved this name. And I don't know, call me, like, I don't know if it's woo woo or what, but I, I always saw this name being a big brand. It was just, it, it, it was something that just I knew in my heart. And so when, um, after closing that second business, um, and wait, you know, many, many years later, when, when we saw this opportunity, um, it was very clear, like mm -hmm. the name was Viore. Mm -hmm. So there was no, there was no, um, other names we considered. Yeah. You had it tucked away and it was just yeah. waiting for the right timing. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's, let's unpack what you think a brand is. What is a brand? Oh, that's such a good question. And something I think about a lot. But I think a brand is just the summation of um, a bunch of, you know, people's feelings about an organization or a concept or, you know, an initiative. It's uh, it's just the collective feelings that people associate with whatever it is. Yeah. And so uh, expand more on on what you think resonates with your customers and like, so why are they coming here? What, what do you think they come here for? Well, you have a men's and women's brand, so maybe they're different. I don't know. Maybe there's overlap. Yeah. You know, the brand started with men's first mm -hmm. and I think it's important to talk about the origin story and the reason that we exist because it, it may partly answer that question. You know, I got into yoga to heal my back. Um, I played football, lacrosse in college. I beat up my body and a friend suggested I try yoga. I fell in love with the practice. I was going to class every day and I started paying attention to the clothing that I was wearing. And, you know, I grew up wearing the big, the big monolithic apparel brands uh, or active apparel brands, I should say. Yeah. And, and as you know, a guy in my early thirties, when I'm on this journey, I started noticing that, you know, it's weird how people in Encinitas don't wear those brands. And I started connecting the dots that like, well, these, a lot of people here are like rooted in these like kind of countercultures like surf and skate and, you know, and they grew up wearing those brands. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, in Southern California beach culture, the traditional kind of activewear brands that really spoke to being a competitive athlete and, you know, they, they, they worked with like kind of shiny synthetic materials and big logos and reflective hits. And, you know, that, that aesthetic didn't really resonate as much with this community. And I always thought that that was interesting. So people were wearing board shorts designed for surfing to the gym. Mm -hmm. Yet they didn't really support you in a great way through a tough workout. Not at all. And that's how I found you actually found the brand is I was looking for the perfect pair of shorts. Yeah. Uh, but continue. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you the whole way. I felt like there was this missing um, link in the industry or in the marketplace. You had the big brands that were distributed at mass market. They worked with you know, slightly less expensive materials and they were really prioritizing footwear. They'd never really made leaps into premium activewear. Yeah, we could say the elephant in the room was just the Nikes and, and all those guys. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then Lululemon came into the space very focused on women and built a really inspiring brand. And they worked with better materials. They paid more attention to construction. and Found a niche for sure. Found a niche. But it yoga was, pants. Yeah. And it, but it was for, it was really always for my wife. It never felt like it was like for me. 100%. <laughs> Yet at the time, like fitness and living an active, healthy lifestyle was just exploding. And we were kind of on the front end of that as yoga began its rise in the US. I mean, there were 30 million people practicing yoga in the US. 30% of them were men. So that's what, give or take 8 million people. And you had, um, I knew as a surfer, there were 4 million people that surfed in the US. And think about all the brands, we were talking about them earlier. So many brands, it was a very competitive space. So I'm like, yeah. inherently there's this massive unserved audience of guys who care about their well being. let alone all the guys going to the gym. You know, what I was experiencing was like, Equinox was on the rise, mm -hmm. Soul Cycle, Barry's Boot Camp, CrossFit, it was like, it was a culture, like people were investing in their health and their wellness. They weren't training to be professional athletes. Right. They just wanted to be healthy. They wanted to continue doing the things that they love to do well into their 50s and 60s. Yeah. And I felt like there wasn't a men's lifestyle brand that really spoke authentically to that way of living. Yeah, you're right. There was no real athletic leisure category either. I mean, uh, back in the day, back in like the Run DMC, Beastie Boys days, the 80s, I can think of the Adidas track suit, you know, that had that had a, a minute. Yeah. Um, but here we are now, you know, 2015, 2018, 2020, you know, we're back into active lifestyle. And you're right, there was nothing. And And I'm... I'm the perfect example. I, here I am, like, going to the gym, looking for a short with a, a liner that I could then go right to either the pool and swim or back to the ocean and either surf or swim, hanging out. And then I, I ended up uh, finding Viore shorts by accident because I did this whole search and I ordered, I don't know, maybe half a dozen different shorts just to try them out. And when I found the Viore short, I was like, okay, this has finally got the fit that I'm looking for. And I ended up, like sleeping in the shorts because they're so comfortable, right? It gets hot at night or whatever. I, you know, um, but like it truly was something I could go to the gym, to the ocean, back to my bed, chill out, work in. And then I discovered the, the joggers, the whole, you know, and that yeah. just became like, Oh, I, I just want to live in this stuff. Yeah. 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 That's an awesome story. I love hearing those stories. It's real though. Um, like could not yeah. find a decent short. Yeah. And so your, 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 your question was really around like, why do people choose Viore or why have we been successful? And I, I think it's really rooted in, you know, product first and foremost, we had a vision for product that we couldn't find. And I think a lot of people felt the same way and it was really rooted in versatility at a time when the market was really all the, you know, the activewear market for men was all about technology and like a lot of synthetic technology like moisture wicking quick drying you know anti-odor and people were like competing on features and benefits um viore came in it with like a different point of view we weren't end use specific you know we were talking about versatility our our guiding principle was built to move in styled for life and it was all about product that would support you through a tough workout 
but it would do so much more. You could wear it on the weekends. It just became a part of your everyday wardrobe. Yeah, it seems better designed too. Yeah, it was like we stripped the product of all those unnecessary bells and whistles that identify you as somebody that's going to the gym or competing in a sport. And we just made it effortless. Mm -hmm. Very much like as we, we think about Southern California beach culture, we think about it, it's sophisticated, it's effortless, it's cool. And that's really what we wanted Viore to represent. And we prioritized, you know, we have a natural sensibility for really soft, incredible fabrics. And to your point earlier, we are very much fabric first. We really want to work with incredible textiles that people just love the sensation on their body. And then we keep the design pretty simple and effortless to make it really wearable. Mm -hmm. And that's been a recipe for us that's, that's worked really well. And we started with men's. But the vision was always to create a dual gender brand. It was, it was really always about Encinitas. It was about our community. It was about our friends. It was men and women living this active lifestyle. It was young families. It was going to the beach and working out and investing in your health and your well-being. And so women were just as much a part of that as men. We just knew that the women's space was more competitive. Um, the men's was a great jumping off point, and we knew women's would quickly follow. So, in how, how long uh, did you do men's before launching women's? 2015 and 16 and 17 were men's only. In okay. 2018, we launched women's. Okay, so another maybe possible lesson is like sort of like uh, get good at something first, hone the craft, sort of perfect it. And you gave yourself three years to do that. Yeah. And then all the while, I'm sure, in the background, you're designing women, you're doing the research, um, and then with confidence, because you see the track record of the traction with men's, then you launch the women's line. Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it. And, and also just, it's really important in the early days of entrepreneurship to be extremely focused. And don't try to do too much too early. Yeah. You know, especially when you're working with limited resources, but even if you have unlimited resources, I think when I think back about this like D to C class of companies that raised a tremendous amount of capital, it led to bad habits. Um, and, and I think that because we started in a little garage, we had really no funding, we, we had to be scrappy and, and be, it forced us to be really focused. Yeah, let's talk about that funding for a second. So how, how were you funding it? Were you self-funded? Were you, did you get outside capital? How did it work? You know, the initial kind of phase of incorporating and everything was, was self-funded. And then we were able to raise a little bit of friends and family money, which was scary, I will admit, because, you know, you don't ever want to lose your friend's money. And mm -hmm. we all know apparel has a pretty high uh, rate of failure. Yeah. Um, burn rate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so we had raised a little bit of money from, um, from friends and family. Was that year one? Was that in 15? We raised a little bit of money, uh, in 20, late 2013. Um, we raised like a little bit. Can you tell us how much it was? Can you uh, say like six figures, seven figures, yeah, eight like figures? What I'll share is that to get this business off the ground in total and summation over a three year period, we raised just north of $2 million. Okay, so yeah, that's the context I was looking for because yeah. that's not a lot of money in the scheme of things. By comparison, you talked about some of these direct to consumer brands, some of these t-shirt and let's just say, yeah, uh, menswear guys that went out big and went hard, they need like a hundred million dollars and they're burning like 99 million of it, yeah. uh, margins are razor thin. That's a tough business. Yeah, and it gave me a bit of a complex at the time because you know I would open up different publications and they'd be talking about the newest activewear brand to come on and get funding from XYZ financial institution with yeah. this big board of directors of these big industry names because athleisure was starting to become a thing and get some traction. Meanwhile, here we were in a little garage and because I didn't have a successful track record, I wasn't a designer, I'd never even worked in this industry, it was hard um, It was hard to convince people to give me the money. So mm -hmm. it wasn't for a lack of trying, you know, we had to have, the, we tried those conversations with financial institutions, they just didn't really go anywhere. So- They didn't get it. Yeah, it was, well, everybody was looking for a hook, you know, is there a customer acquisition strategy here that's unique? Are you leveraging technology in a unique way? Yeah. Like what's designer, the, big designer. What, name. What's the, yeah, is there a big celebrity behind this? Like, what is the hook? And the truth was, 
the, what we explained was what I explained to you, that there was this cultural zeitgeist, this, this cultural opportunity that we could tap into, that we were going to make great product, that we we're going to build an incredible culture. We we're going to treat our customers really well. And, you know, that a lot of, a lot of that can be perceived as lip service because it's it's not anything you can really sink your teeth in and i'm sure when you go back to an investment committee that doesn't sound very compelling so so yeah we struggled to to raise money in those early days and yeah. it was it was hard seeing competitors of ours ra having more success raising capital but you know when we think about the journey and you know hindsight's always 2020 but sitting where we are today and looking back things really happened exactly how how we you know, had hoped that they would. You yeah. Know? Well, it's maybe, you know, it's tortoise in the hair kind of thing, right? You know, the hair gets a quick start, is out quickly, but like slow and steady wins the race, right? That was our, that was, the, that was very much true for us. Yeah. yeah. I love that story. Um, was there any temptation? I'm just curious, you personally, like to, you know, you're, you're, it almost seems deliberately out of the picture. Like we don't see your face on billboards. Your name is not, your signature is not on any of the apparel. It could have been. Uh, that seems like a deliberate choice. Talk about that, you know, brand, that brand choice. You know, it's funny you say that. The early days I was on all the marketing, you know, I was, I was the model because okay. we couldn't afford models. Well, but, so I did it myself. Yeah, but you, you were a model, right? Like, so that actually has, you got street credit. Yeah. My friends always joke that I started an apparel business to save my ailing modeling career, yeah. but, which is funny. <laughs> um, but, but no, like we, I did do a lot of the early photo shoots and, um, I know, but, but you're, but you were, you're not like, um, maybe let's use, let's use, uh, Ralph. Cause you know, we've been talking about Ralph Lauren and he's iconic and, um, you know, Ralph was very much a part of his brand, right? It's Ralph Lauren. He's in the name, right? Yeah. Uh, funny thing is this is actually not his real name. Ralph's real name is Ralph Lipschitz. <laughs> Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Changed his name, you know, kind of like a stage name, but, um, it works. Um, but here you are, you know, Average Joe, let's say, you know, but you had this opportunity to to blow it big. But you decided not to. Your signature is not on stuff. You know, you're you you're very much in the background. Is that's a well, deliberate choice? The business, this business was built by a collective of amazing people. You know, not just me. It's really important. One of my favorite quotes is, "It's incredible what you can accomplish when nobody cares who gets the credit." This is this business was never about me. Um, it was about all of us. And you know, I. I do really, you know, believe that Viore is an extension of all the things that I care deeply about. It's a very authentic brand. Like this brand was never manufactured. It's <clears throat> everything that we stand for is a direct reflection of my personal values and the things that I love in this world. Yeah. And I think that that made it easy. Um, you know, it wasn't a manufactured business plan, seeing an oppor market opportunity. I think the market opportunity naturally aligned with my curiosities and interests at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I asked that question just so you have the context. I'm, I'm guessing that people out there are trying to decide, you know, they're at a crossroads. It's like, do I, do I become the Ralph Lauren of my industry or do I go the Viore route, which is almost kind of like the Patagonia route, mm -hmm. right? That Patagonia brand is a similar path that Viore has taken, right? You, you can't rattle off the the uh, the founder's name, uh, even though he's prolific and famous in his own right for doing amazing things and taking care of his employees, but you've sort of gone down that path, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very difficult choice, uh, but it was easy for you to make because you had that vision of it being bigger than Joe or you know anyone's particular name, but you you saw the path. But yeah, I think you see that a lot in designer, you know, where the designer really starts the business, and yeah. you know, in my case. I've been a self-taught designer. You know, I didn't come into this with a lot of design experience. I learned so much from wildly talented creatives that I surrounded myself with. Um, and so, yeah, it would never feel authentic to, to name this brand after me. Um, yeah, I, it's a choice though. You, and, yeah. you know, it's a choice that you have to make when you're starting something, right? Yeah. Like, uh, what mistakes did you make? Because no one gets here unscathed and i asked that in the context of like what did you get wrong in order to get it right i mean there's there's a, a couple of things you know 
we talked about the first two tries in the apparel industry. And so those were really great learning opportunities for me in, in terms of just jumping in with two feet and being solely devoted to something that was really important for me. So that was one big lesson early. But then once we started Viore, you know, the journey has been a long and windy road and, you know, we almost ran out of money. Um, and uh, hadn't really defined an engine of growth, so didn't really have a path to getting more money. Well, what model would you put your finger on? Is is it a direct-to-consumer model? Is it an e-com model? Here we are in retail stores. You have 32 of them now, I think. Yeah. And expanding internationally, but like, w w what model did you pick to start? Yeah, so um, that's, that's good. I'm gonna answer that question and the question before it in the same response, because um, the, re the, the distribution strategy of Viore was uh, our first kind of misstep on this journey. Um, you know, we launched, and at the time there were so many premium women's activewear brands that were selling at places like Equinox and Core Power Yoga and Yoga Works. And there were chains with hundreds of doors. I mean, di decent distribution and people were building great little five, $10 million women, premium women's activewear businesses. And we went up to this trade show called the Active Collective. And we were the only men's brand there in a sea of women's brands. And all of these brands were competing for that premium fitness studio distribution. Mm -hmm. um, and you could build a great little business. So our first premise was like, well, there are men that work out at these places too. Yeah. And so we can sell in and build a great little wholesale business as we think about our direct to consumer strategy. But keep in mind, we, we were working on a shoestring budget. So the idea of going out and spending, you know, 20 grand a month in digital advertising sounded crazy to me at the time. You know, and this is on the forefront of in marketing on the internet. Remind, back in 2015, people were just starting to explore advertising on Facebook. There was no advertising on Instagram. It, that came later, mm -hmm. but, but this is just, you know, moment in history. And so we sold into a lot of these premium fitness chains, a lot of yoga studios, and we quickly learned that, you know, in the yoga chain specifically, which was where a lot of our distribution was, Men were, I think, maybe hesitant enough to go to yoga at that time, let alone stick around and shop afterwards. Right. So really the only sales we were getting is if somebody forgot their shorts at home. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that was not a foundation for building a business. Yeah. And so that was misstep number one. We spent a lot of time and energy pursuing that strategy and we were about to run out of money um, before we decided to pivot and go all in on that direct relationship with our customer. And it was, okay. it was the hardest lesson, but the best thing that ever happened to us. Yeah, because distribution is key, but like relying on someone else to see your vision and take it in, there's two steps, right? There's sell in and then there's sell through. Yeah. So if it doesn't sell through, sometimes you have to do those deals where deals on wheels. It's like, yeah. okay, we'll take it in, but if it doesn't sell, you gotta take it back. Absolutely. Right, and they just charge backs and all that garbage. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that, and you know when we when we got meetings with the larger wholesale uh, accounts, the the larger retailers, you know we would meet with these merchants, and they they were very clear. Like I sell lifestyle apparel, and this person over here sells activewear, and this is what activewear looks like, and this is what lifestyle apparel looks like. And we would show up, and they'd be like, "Well, this doesn't look like activewear." Right. And and then this person over here would be like, "Yeah, but it's a little weird for for sportswear." And we'd be like, that's exactly the point. That's why we're a new perspective on performance apparel. Yeah. We're doing something different. We, we believe in breaking down those barriers, but they had no per place on the floor for us because they were like, it won't look good over here. It won't look over here. So inherent in our business kind of strategy and our thesis for why we exist was a big challenge and a roadblock in terms of selling into traditional accounts. So we really had to build the business direct. Yeah, to invent it, yeah. And again, another great lesson, right? This this saying that Henry Ford gets credited with, which is, you know, if I asked the people what they wanted, they would have said, I want a faster horse. But instead he invents, you know, the assembly line for assembling, you know, the cars and changes the industry. That's kind of what you guys had to do. Like, hey, these people in our distri distribution don't really get our vision to the point that we need them to get it. Yeah. So we need to invent basically our own distribution. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of a story. We we're in New York and I was in a, with meeting with a buyer and she looks at this product and she goes, this will never sell in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so I went home with my tail tucked between my legs 
now today we're the number one apparel partner at that at that retailer um and we sell you know top brand in all their new york doors so yeah. and you just opened a new york store too right yeah in soho or someplace yeah we just opened in in soho we're opening our second store later this year on the upper east side mm -hmm. did you invite that person to the, the store opening <laughs> well, now they're a great partner and friend of the brand and we we can joke about those early days you know but but it was different you know and i don't blame anybody it, it did look different it kind of looked like almost a hybrid between swimwear and activewear and you know activewear had a very defined look at the time so i don't i don't blame anybody for for not seeing that at, at the time um, and it was the best blessing because ultimately it steered us towards a D2C model. We learned how to market to people through the internet, um, through social channels at the time namely and then that expanded from there. But we became really data driven, you know, analytics came natural to us. We became very obsessed with data and understanding our customer's journey, how to best serve the customer. and. And that was a blessing because when we built that direct to consumer model, we were able to present the world with our vision for our brand. Yeah. They were able to understand what we were doing. And then the wholesale accounts eventually took notice and we never alienated them. You know, in the, at the time, the D to C playbook was like pure play. You're either a purist or you're not, or you're nothing, you know? So people were cutting out wholesale altogether. Well, and in, in, uh, along with that is spending gobs of money on advertising. It's all advertising. Yeah. It's all sizzle. Not a lot of stake. Yeah. 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 We couldn't play by that rule because we didn't have enough money to do it. So we could only acquire customers profitably. That was the only way we could do it. So it, it created a good habit. And then we didn't have the working capital to go out and grow super fast. So instead of going out and raising my series A, B and C from big institutions, I went to our vendor base and I invested in building really great relationships with our vendor partners. And they ultimately trusted in what we were doing and extended us great terms. And so in some respects, while they didn't take an ownership interest in my business, our vendors became like our investors. Um, and that was something that I have to credit Kevin Plank at Under Armour for. I listened to him speak once and he told me, or he didn't tell me, he told the audience like, founders today have it wrong. They're so obsessed with these increased valuations and raising their A, B and C round. They're like, but if in the, within apparel, if you can go to your factory partners and build the right relationship, they can be your investor, your bank, your everything. Yeah. And and I really took that to heart and I started prioritizing building those great relationships and eventually getting the terms that I needed where I could build the business organically yeah. and not rely on outside funding to do it. Let's go back to the analytics. Um, I'm curious what you learned about your consumer base. You said you were really paying attention to what was happening, um, paying attention to the analytics. What did you learn? Well, you know, kind of to answer two questions at once, the second misstep that we made was when we launched, we saw that there was a massive underserved audience of males practicing yoga in the United States. And so our original messaging when we launched online was very yoga centric you know, men doing yoga poses, wearing our gear in cool environments. And, and through that direct relationship with the customer, every purchase, there was a post-purchase survey. And so we could get that direct feedback from the customer. And we asked them, you know, what are they using the product for? What do they love what, about it? What other brands are they wearing? All the, just all these things to help us understand if we were on the right path. And what we learned very quickly was that people loved the product, but they were wearing it for literally, it was like, running was number one, going to the gym, wearing around the house, chasing their kids around, you know, travel. There was like 20 things they were doing before they were wearing it to yoga. And what came very clear was people love the versatility. And that was always like our product ethos, but it wasn't something we led with from a messaging standpoint. And so I remember I was sitting on my couch one Sunday reading these customer reviews and I just took a bunch of our shorts and we had all these different colors and prints of our, our most iconic short, the core short. And I just put them with a white background. I put all these shorts across the bottom. And on the top, I put run, hike, train, travel, chill. And I was like, let's just see how this ad does. Mm -hmm. And we put it out into the universe. And all of a sudden, it was like the product, the messaging were aligned. And we just started having incredible success. And I was like, wow, I started to understand the power of advertising and having the right 
product and marketing fit. And then we learned to be nimble and try new things and A-B test. And we, you know, went on the journey of becoming a, you know, modern D2C brand. Yeah. And, uh, but it was really listening to the customer that showed us, that, that guided us towards getting that marketing message right. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your marketing mix. So now it's more sophisticated, I would assume. Break it down for us. Like, where are you spending? Give us percentages. Um, you know, like, uh, I'm seeing some stuff on TV now. Uh, you are doing partnerships with people like Rob Machado or uh, Livy Dunn or, you know, some of these influencers. Uh, talk about the marketing mix. Yeah, you know, it's, it's historically been, you know, very digitally focused. Um, you know, advertising on all the social channels like you would expect. Um, you know, we, we then kind of broke into podcasts and in those early days of advertising as podcasts were becoming really popular. And again, that was just kind of authentic and organic. I started listening to, you know, Tim Ferriss and, you know, all of these people that were, you know, providing inspiring stories. And then we started advertising on a lot of these podcasts that we listen to. And so that was a channel for us. And then we, we launched a direct mail catalog because in digital, you really advertise like a couple of hero products, mm -hmm. but we had this incredible line that we really wanted to con convey um, and show people. And so the catalog was a great venue to do that, to yeah. show, show more product across both men's and women's. Kind of like the Patagonia model. Yeah. Yeah. They did the same kind of thing. So we extended into catalog, um, and then, you know, eventually television became affordable enough. You know, we were always watching television, but the cost of advertising got really expensive for a while. And then it started to come down. We started buying like remnant space. So we weren't even, you know, doing national buys. It was just the kind of when things yeah. would opportunistically present themselves. And, um, and then that started doing well. And we were able to measure television and, and, and get great, rec uh, great uh, results. And so we started growing that mix. And so today... You know, it's it's hard. You know, there's there's not a lot of channels that we're not exploring. Um, let's let's cut it up into a pie piece. So, um, what percentage of the business? Um, well, let's talk about wholesale versus direct to consumer. You still have a wholesale business. Yeah. About what percentage is wholesale to DTC? Wholesale is sub twenty percent. Okay. Um, so it's a smaller business for us. E-commerce is our largest channel. Okay. Um, and then our, our retail business, which, you know, started with one little pop-up and that's a whole journey into how we learn to be retailers. Um, but, but, um, today we have 32 stores in the U S we have one store in London. Um, we're going to open another 20 stores this year. So we're very busy on, on that front and, and retail by 2025 will be, we forecast will be as big as our e-commerce business. Wow. Okay. So put a pin in that for a second, because I want to break down, um, okay, wholesale to direct consumer. You're saying DTC is about 85 to 90% I'm hearing and wholesale is under 20%. So it's yeah, you so know, 80, 20 or. Yeah. Or, yeah. We're about give or take 80, 20. And then the direct portion of that business is divided between, you know, our stores yep. and, and e-com, e-com being the largest. Okay. And then in terms of advertising and marketing, let's break it down to digital, which would include a PPC or uh, an Instagram buy or, and then uh, by contrast, let's call it traditional, which is either like billboard, out of home uh, broadcast. What's the percentage breakdown there in media mix? It's high 90s percent digital. Okay. So you're, you're, you're finding opportunities on TV, remnant open spots, spot markets. Yeah. Uh, and you're just trying to be opportunistic yeah for reach and exposure and, you know we you know during the nba playoffs like we advertised um a few spots during the lakers games and those got really good reception and yeah. you know we actually did a uh it wasn't a national buy but we got a um we had a uh, it was a direct tv buy for the super bowl so there's been like really fun moments that we show up on tv and yeah you know my friends joke that i'm you know like hucking sweatpants on television because some of the commercials are me talking about our most popular joggers and yeah. so people love to poke fun at that but 
But yeah, it's been an incredible journey learning television and learning how television advertising works. Yeah, I, again, an, another lesson to extract is you're experimenting and you're trying stuff and you're seeing what, what works, what doesn't work. You're not going all in on one that you have no idea about. Digital is so measurable and you can track it. When digital advertising started, um, it was always a bit, um, you know, problematic for our wholesale partners because they would feel like we're advertising to get people to shop with us direct. Right, that like it would cannibalize their... That it would cannibalize their business. But what we learned quickly was that the brands that were had big D2C or digital advertising budgets were actually performing better than other brands in wholesale. Because at the end of the day, they were building awareness. And it was just, instead of doing it through, you know, traditional means like magazine ads, we're now doing it digitally. And, you know, there is more of a direct call to action to shop on a website. But at the end of the day, um, you know, getting getting those ads out, it just created awareness yeah. at the end of the day. So it, it really was like the high tide lifted all boats. And where are you seeing the most success on some of the social platforms? Like, where is it popping off today? You know, it's a different landscape today. And I always talk about, you know, I, my heart goes out to people that are starting consumer businesses today because it's very challenging. The name of the game now is really about distribution of your idea. Um, and so if you're not a famous celebrity or an influencer with a massive audience, it's really hard to get out of the gates. There's not as much trust on the social platforms. There's so many brands, like think about it. Every time you open your feed, you're just getting hit with a new brand or a new concept. And so it's almost become a bit commoditized yeah. advertising in, in a social feed. And it's a lot more expensive to do it. It's just a lot more competitive. So we had the benefit of starting back in 2015 when things were a little more, um, you know, affordable. You could reach a bigger audience. Yeah, the early days, yeah. Yeah, so when you think about today, you know, we still are advertising on those big channels because we've got legacy. We've got so much first party data. We've got a, a lot of customers in the brand. Um, and so we're still, you know, our, our largest channel is still Facebook. To this day, it performs better than any other channel. And by Facebook, it means Facebook and Instagram. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Um, but it's 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 a different landscape um, than it used to be. We yeah. can afford now, as a brand with a with a customer base as, as large as ours is, um, we can afford a little bit higher CPA to, yeah. to bring in new customers. Yeah. Where it's a little harder when you're first starting out. Makes sense. Uh, how about partnerships? So, what's the strategy behind? Uh, a Rob Machado or a Livy Dunn. Talk about that. Yeah, Athlete Partnerships um, is a, was relatively new for us. During the pandemic, you know, I remember we shut down our offices, we shut down our stores, and Viore was one of the first brands to start offering free digital classes on our Instagram. And so we started working with all these trainers and um, we met all these really inspiring people that like we loved building relationships with and we loved how they interacted with our community and how they were adding value to our to our community's lives at a time when they really needed support and so what became a digital kind of free fitness class evolved into like athlete partnerships for us because a lot of these trainers became what we call collaborators but but yeah. they became paid um you know, ambassadors of, of the brand. Yeah, I mean, they have the legitimacy. They may also have a small following, which is not terrible either, right? Yeah. Um, but the legitimacy of their talent, yeah, I get it. And they lived in our product all day, every day. That's what they do, you know? And so they were helpful on multiple fronts. They could inspire our community, and um, but at the same time provide great valuable feedback to us um, on how to make our product better. Um, and so that led us into exploring additional types of partnerships and you know Rob uh, Machado famous surfer Taylor Knox another famous surfer from from our backyard down here in San Diego they're led le local legends here but with international reach and um, and it just made sense they were a, they were incredible like pillars of our community aligned 100% from a values standpoint with the brand, with what Rob was up to with his foundation. And so we were able to partner with Rob to provide free, like clean drinking water into schools throughout San Diego, mm -hmm. um, you know, and just creating content and, and, and creating really cool products for surfing and going to the beach with both Rob and Taylor has been really inspiring. And those were, you know, icons and legends and heroes of mine um, growing up. And so it's it's been fun to work with them. And then 
Livy Dunn is somebody who, you know, was is an incredible athlete. She's a world class gymnast at LSU. She's really found a unique um, way to connect with her audience. Um, and so when NIL became a, a thing, we were introduced to Livy again. We just loved what she stood for and what she was up to, and we partnered with Livy, and and that's been an incredible partnership. Um, and so, what a great uh, what a great vision though, and the timing doesn't hurt either. Yeah. Like this this NIL thing, uh, and I was watching the Nike documentary. I mean, it's sort of a, a quasi documentary with. Um, you know, portrayed by actors. Have you seen it yet? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there's some creative license that was taken there with the storyline. But it's interesting that the foundation for NIL was uh, was laid back then. But like now you guys are being able to take advantage of it, um, tapping into her audience, her athleticism. Uh, it seems like such a perfect fit for the women's brand because you know, she's sort of right in the crosshairs of the people who are buying the product, or at least, you know, starting to think about the product. Who else are you thinking about? Like, where, like, maybe not specific people, but what other categories? So you have sort of like gymnastics, you have the core surfer, uh, where else are you looking towards? What yeah. verticals? It's interesting, you know, the, the, the kind of the Nike playbook is to build these like verticals under each sport, yeah. right? And go in and own these sports, basketball, yeah. tennis, running, golf, yeah. running, yeah. And we, we don't really look at our business the same way. You know, Viore was really a lifestyle brand and, and it was designed to kind of cross over these boundaries. So we don't look at it like athlete, team supporting athlete, build out distribution within this vertical. Like we're gonna go build out this huge tennis collection. We're gonna have tennis athletes and we're gonna build a tennis team to support. Um, at Viore, we're looking for people that are really aligned with our values that live an active lifestyle and m more than just competing in their sport, you know, they've, you know, got um, a voice or something that there's, you know, there's got to just be a values alignment. Mm -hmm. And so whether they're a tennis player or a golfer or a runner, um, you know, our, our product naturally lends itself to those sports and activities. And so <clears throat> naturally we want there to be an alignment between the, the product that we make and what they do, but but it's it's a little bit non-traditional, and we're really just looking at it from the sense of like, we wanna tell really great stories um, of people who are up to really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't really put a boundary around what sport or activity that they, they need to be in. I love that. Where is the brand heading? So you talked about 32 retail stores, you're gonna add 20 more. Um, so that sort of is counterintuitive, I think, when a lot of people are saying, well, e-commerce is where it's at. I want less, you know, headache of having to build a store. Why, why build retail stores? Why is that a good idea? I mean, our vision for the brand was to inspire happiness, plain and simple. Like we wanted to do more than make great product. And it was about building a great culture within our four walls, treating people incredibly well and inspiring people to live <clears throat> incredible lives. And and so for us, there's no more powerful way to do that than within our four walls of our stores. And I'm so proud of our retail business. The, the people that lead our retail business are truly one of a kind. Um, and before we open any market, we have a really cool strategy for getting into the community, figuring out how we can be in service to the community. When we open our four walls, we're constantly inviting third parties to come in and host events and, um, you know, the people that work in our stores are just incredible. Um, the service level is incredible. We get to we get to showcase a lot of amazing product. Where like through D 2 C, you're really like there's only so many stories you can tell. There's only so many products you can highlight. Well, you're right. And, and in my personal experience, going back to that, I bought six different brands of shorts because I, I you know they, you can look at them online, but you have to order them and then try them on and then vet them. You can't go into any store for that. Yeah. At least I, I couldn't at the time. And that was how I experienced the brand. Yeah. But yeah, going into retail, you can feel stuff and you can try it and you can get the vibe. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's that's spot on. Being a brand that prioritized fabric first and really has become known for this incredibly soft hand, um, there's no better venue to showcase that than in a store. So there's a lot of reasons that we love our stores. 
but um but yeah, I think I think first and foremost is it's really they're directly connected to our vision uh, for the brand. And then how about innovating? So you've got sort of athleisure dialed. It's a very fashionable but also functional brand. How are you innovating? So again, it starts at the fabric level for us. Um, and so we have a, we have a fabric innovation office in Taipei in Taiwan um, and. Um, they're just up to some really cool stuff. Can you tease, like, <laughs> give, give us a little tease? You know, like, what I, what I would say is that you know we've extended beyond athleisure into product to service, the outdoor life, active lifestyle, swim and beach lifestyle, and what we call travel commute, which is everyday sportswear that you would wear to the office or to the golf course. And we've got foundational kind of fabric franchises that service each of these end uses or categories. Um, and so we have innovation pipelines in all of them um, to just build products and fabrics, textiles first, mm -hmm. that are gonna meet or exceed the, the expectations of our customers. You know, it, it's all about just wowing our customers with, with the sensation that they have on body. So I'm just sort of looking around the store here. Everything is either a short sleeve or a short. <laughs> to me, what you just said very cryptically and well, diplomatically, Pants are coming. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a pants offering right now. Given that we're approaching summer, you don't see as many in the store. But no, I mean like you know, like that you could wear to the office, or you could wear on the golf course, or to a pitch meeting. If you're someone like me, and you know who uh, makes pitches and proposals, or jump on an airplane to Tokyo and direct a commercial. Like yeah. I could. It's like you know, the equivalent of the short that could do everything you're gonna maybe have s slightly more sophisticated, let's say style yeah. options. That category is one of the fastest growing segments of our business today. Yeah, um, and that's exciting. You know, coming out of the pandemic, there was always a question, because we, we became, you know, it was like the alignment of the brand with the way that people were living their lives during the pandemic was a natural tailwind and an accelerant for a business. And just like, you know, the Pelotons of the world and other, you know, bike brands that just had incredible success during the pandemic, there was always this question, well, what was going to happen after? Um, and we're really proud that, you know, while our customer isn't buying as many joggers or, you know, the, that loungewear that they were wearing when they were just staying home all day, they're really staying with us and they're trying our travel commute products. So those pants that you mentioned, we make this pant called the Meta, which is this, it's a knit fabric, but it feels like a woven and it is, it doesn't wrinkle. It's my go-to travel pant. It's become a sensation at Viore um, and we're building assortments around it. And so, yeah, it's that category is exciting for us. We've had a lot of success early with outerwear mm -hmm. and bringing our DNA and our versatile aesthetic into technical outerwear. So there's going to be more product that we're building there. And, and so it's just exciting. I mean, we're a product or first company I and mean, we get, that's what gets us up in the morning. We love building great product. We love thinking about what our customers needs are. Um, and, uh, and so we, we've got a really exciting pipeline kind of across the board. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll uh, be waiting with anticipation to see what's coming. Uh, maybe kind of uh, wrapping things up, give us maybe your final words of advice to entrepreneurs who are in the trenches, you know, right now doing their thing, trying to work it out. So this question is always interesting because I think I would give advice, different advice to, to people at different points in the journey. And I think the, the answer to that question is always going to change based on where you're at on the path. And in the early days, it's resilience, have conviction, you know, surround yourself. The one thing that's constant, no matter where you're at in the journey, surround yourself with incredible people. Don't have an ego. Recognize early that like bring you need to bring in people that are better than you, that are smarter than you, that have great experience in their respective area of the business. And that will empower you to be a better leader, but bring in wildly talented people and, and share the success with them. You know, that is what great relationships and great culture is all about. Um, and so I am I'm a I think that's very important. Um, you know, 
the resilience is very important because there are so many times along the journey that you want to give up. Don't pay attention to too many so-called experts. Really like listen to yourself. And and this is maybe my biggest piece of advice. Um, and maybe this is the yogi within me sharing this, but I really believe that developing practices to seek clarity in your life is maybe the most important thing you can do as an entrepreneur because it's the, the needs of the business are constantly changing. And what's important as, as the founder is that you see when those needs present themselves and you can respond accordingly um, and make good decisions. Great businesses are a, an accumulation of good decisions made over a long period of time. And so to make good decisions, you need to be clear, which means take the time to go develop a meditation practice, get into breath work, go to a yoga class, go walk in the woods by yourself, take whatever it is for you. It's not prescriptive for all. It's like, go find out what it is that helps you find clarity and go do more of that because it will service you tenfold on the journey. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from. And...